we're starting our work with GeoServer, sort of closing the loop on that entire stack of capabilities that we've been talking about all semester. We focused on the client side with the JavaScript uh, frameworks for the Google API and open layers. We've talked about the interoperability standards that we can use to access data that are published using the OGC standards and either bring them into open layers or bring them into the desktop applications. Tonight we start talking about um, actually publishing your own data. So, I, you know, over the course of the last um, three months, there have been any number of times when their questions have come up in terms of, so how do I, how, how do I get my data into my mapping client? Or how can, I, how can I get my data into the GIS using these services? This is how. GeoServer is an example of any number of platforms, some of which I mentioned in the lecture, that you can use for publishing your own data using these open standards um, so that they can then be accessed and used by whether it's web-based or desktop clients. So this is a critical part of the ecosystem where we've been pretty much consuming services that are out there on the web uh, thus far now we're actually contributing data and services to the rest of the network um, that where, where we may have particular products or data that we need to share. So with that, we can start with GeoServer. And the GeoServer instance that is running is uh, just on a, a server running in the other room here. And that instance is uh, based on the current version of GeoServer that was just installed in February. Speaking of versions, I actually discovered as I was reinstalling Quantum GIS um, that even in the time since many of us may have installed the software in um, January, there's actually an even more recent release of, uh, of Quantum GIS. So if you want to be able to run the most recent version, uh, which is now version 2.2, I would suggest going back to the Quantum GIS site and, uh, and downloading that more recent version. Uh, they, they just uh, put it out relatively recently. Um, I also uh, was able to find out the, um, the reason for our whole train wreck of demos last week is that, that during, during the time when I was trying to connect to our services in Argus, those are exactly the times when our systems person thought it was safe because it was after five to actually start uh, rebooting our individual servers that are providing those services. <laughs> so timing was really perfect for, uh, for doing, those, uh, doing those demos. Um, but that's all been resolved now. So the GeoServer instance that we're running for the class is um, located at this, at this web address, uh, geog485.unm.edu colon 8080, don't forget that colon 8080, as that's the specific port on the server that is listening for your incoming request to go to the geo server. If you don't include that colon 8080, you're gonna get a generic message from the web server that's running on the system. Um, slash geo server slash web. And that then takes you to this entry screen for the geo server where there's even information that you can see in the GeoServer instance um, relating to the available layers and other information about the server that is essentially publicly available. So I haven't logged into the GeoServer yet. Um, so you can actually, without logging in, take a look at the layer preview and any layers that are actually published publicly that are available to users who are not logged into the system. You see here, this instance is actually pre-populated with a number of sample data sets and uh, uh, workspaces, stores, and layers. As you add new publicly available data sets to the system, you can actually come and look at the layer preview without even logging in to see um, whether or not uh, those are showing up and behaving the way you, you expect. Um, this is the same thing that you can actually uh, method you can use for actually connecting to the OGC services that are published as a part of the server as well. Um, but here, I'm gonna log in. 
And the principle here is that I use the same usernames and passwords for both the class server for connecting to the class server to interact with the terminal to work with data that are sitting on the server and the geo server instance that you use to log in through the web. So it should be the same username and completely cryptic password that I sent you on uh, Sunday night. Again, if you haven't had a chance to test those out yet, today, right now, <laughs> would be a good time to test those out so we can make sure if there are any, any issues, we can get them resolved. Um, so I'm going to log in. So of course, if I can remember my password. There we go. And the one difference is what you're seeing here is the interface for someone who is an administrative user. So there are actually a lot more of these configuration and settings options showing up here than if I'm logged in as a student. So if I So now I'm logged in as a student and you can see that the options on the left hand side of the screen are much shorter, but they're all of the options that you need to be able to work within a particular workspace that has already been created, um, creating new data stores, which are essentially linkages to data sets, and then creating new layers based on those stores that you create, which is essentially the process you need to go through when creating new layers on the, on, in GeoServer. So let me do a very quick walkthrough of some of the administrative components just so you can see what some of the options are because in the long run, if you find yourself wanting to potentially stand up an instance of GeoServer um, on a server that you might have access to or potentially you know, maybe even a server that's hosted through Amazon's or Google's or My Microsoft's cloud system, having, a, having an idea of what the administrative options look like uh, can be helpful. <coughs> and this is what I walked through in the lecture, so I'm not going to belabor it too much. Um, but some of the key things that you want to keep in mind as you're setting up the new server um, is number one, the contact information. This is still the generic information that is basically a part of the default installation of GeoServer. For your own GeoServer that you might be using, you're absolutely going to want to fill this information in because this is some of the information that is actually put into the Get Capabilities content for the services that are published by this GeoServer. So you want to make sure that that is accurately reflecting the who's responsible for the server and who the contact information and, and all of that is. Um, the About Geo Server gives you information about the current version um, and uh, you know when it was built and all of that. It also, and this is something to keep an eye out for, provides links to the documentation, the wiki with some additional information about Geo Server, um, and then a system for uh, for submitting bugs that you might find in, in the program, and also for looking to see if some weird behavior that you've encountered is actually a known bug that someone's either working on or that will never be fixed and is going to cause you to pull your hair out for the rest of your life. Um, but either way, uh, you can do that search within the bug tracker. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about the data area in a few minutes. Um, the services, this is another area where, um, let's start with the web map services. You can then set some specific information that is also going into the capabilities response for uh, that particular service. So that contact information is stuff across the entire server. Now you can provide some more granular information that is specific to the web map services that are being published. Again, who the maintainers, who the, what the online resource is for the, for the, um, the connections. Um, what the title of the service is. This is one of the areas where if you've connected to a geo server 
instance as a part of you know now the many times you've gone out looking for OGC services you may very well find a uh, an unconfigured or minimally configured web map service that shows up as GeoServer web map service as the uh, as the title of the the service that you're connecting to this is why um, because that has not been customized to sp be more specific or clear about the specific ser uh, service you're talking about um, an abstract that again you can describe the nature of your specific web map service then other other uh, bits of information that again by now should be fairly familiar to you from your um, examination of those capabilities response ad nauseum um, then a lot of other options for uh, different data types uh, this limited SRS list I mentioned this in the lecture but it bears repeating um, when you're standing up a production geo server geo server supports a massive number of uh, coordinate reference systems so if you uh, go into a system that does not have a limitation essentially this limited SRS list specified there have been instances where there are so many projections that are advertised as being supported by the service that some client applications essentially choke on the amount of information being provided specifically related to projections so for a production system you definitely want to set this limited SRS list and this is the, the same thing applies to web coverage services and web feature services as well um, if you don't do that there will be some clients that will probably have issues connecting to your server um, ways to control the amount of memory and processing uh, amount of memory and processing time and capacity used by the system all sorts of options for the different graphics formats and other data formats just lots of stuff that you can use to tune up the particular services if we look at web feature or web coverage services it's similar additional metadata specific to the service a limit on the server side in terms of the maximum number of features that uh, will be returned by the service you know just as we were talking um, last week about the option in Arc, uh, ArcGIS to when you're connecting to or configuring a web feature service to limit the number of features that you're going to ask for a similar setting can be set up on GeoServer where GeoServer won't try to deliver more features than you set up here this prevents your GeoServer from essentially running amok and trying to deliver all the features in a data set that may consist of millions of <laughs> points or polygons so this is a way to kind of protect your system from crashing itself from trying to deliver too many features um, different options for the flavors of GML that are that are that are supported um, and then again some other options as well web coverage services this should be uh, fairly familiar now the metadata and then also some some ways to control processing and and uh, and such overhead that is used by the system in supporting those services that you may may occasionally want to look in some of the global settings though they primarily um, apply to a lot of the logging capabilities but if you're also working in a particular uh, web hosting environment you may need to check some of the options here in terms of uh, you know uh, 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 where's the, the proxy services and then also if you're trying to figure out problems you can change the logging profiles the amount of detail essentially that is captured in the logs on a production system you generally want to keep that logging profile fairly lightweight because logging takes takes resources and if the system is running the way it should you probably don't want to be spending those resources writing these incredibly verbose uh, log files tracking every single nuance of the interactions with the system but when you're first setting a system up or trying to troubleshoot it log, uh, tuning up these logging options is the way to go um, there are there is now uh, uh, tile configuration options and we really haven't talked about that here but th these are some uh, capabilities for being able to optimize your services especially your web map services by pre-generating uh, map tiles 
so that when uh, systems are interacting with your, your server as a web map tile service, they can pull these pre-generated map tiles out of the cache as opposed to regenerating them from the data every time. Um, since we haven't been working at all with, the, with web map tile services so far, we're not going to focus it here, but this is a capability that's now gone into production where in the previous releases of GeoServer it had been sort of an experimental capability. It's now sort of gone live. And then there is a security area where you have all sorts of options for the security settings for the system. Uh, one of particular interest is, of course, the users, groups, and roles where you can actually, this is where you manage the different users and groups. So this is where I set up the accounts for all of you. And then for each of you, set your passwords in the system and assigned you to the student role. So the student role is then used for the other security settings. So if I go into the uh, data, you can see there are some uh, security rules that have been set for the data sets where essentially um, students and instructor roles have been given administrative privileges for all workspaces and all, um, all uh, stores, meaning that you can actually uh, create new stores and new layers. Um, but this is slightly less than the blanket administrative privileges that have been given previously as the granularity has, has gotten better in being able to manage this. Um, so this is, this is where those, those rules get set up. Um, and then you can similarly set rules on the services. So if you really only want authenticated users to be able to access your web coverage and web feature services, for example, say you're trying to make money hosting these services and you only want to allow access to subscribers, you can create accounts for those subscribers. They have to actually authenticate and you would set up rules here saying, you know, those in my subscribers role actually can, you know, get access to those data services. Otherwise, they may only get the map services, something like that. But this is where you have that, that option in the security system. So any questions about sort of some of the high-level administrative stuff that's happening behind the curtain before I then walk through the process of creating stores, adding layers? Okay. So let me log out so you can see what this is going to look like for you. So with the exception of the layer preview, which historically has actually been at the bottom, so it's a nice sort of top to bottom sort of workflow, the standard process is that for any, any work that you're doing, that work has to take place in a workspace. And so if a workspace exists, great, you can select it. Um, you have to actually be an administrator for GeoServer to create new workspaces. So, you, so at this point, if I click on workspaces, you can see all of the existing workspaces, but you'll notice that this add new workspace is actually not a live link. That's because um, for the student role, you can't create new workspaces. That's why I went through and actually created a workspace for each one of you that's essentially an S underbar and then your username. So this is the workspace that you should be using for any of your work for the class. Um, So workspace creation is, is not really an issue for you now. You can actually go into a workspace and look at its settings. So if we go down into my test student workspace here, I have basically two options, you know, two things that I can change. I actually can, actually, well, it, it won't even let me change those values. So I can look at them, but I can't even change them. Um, but this is where you can see the information about the workspace at least. You really start to get into the the work, the day-to-day -day work with GeoServer when you start going into the stores. Because stores, again, are the linkages to the data sets that are sitting on the file system of the server that GeoServer is running on top of. 
There are only two exceptions to that. You can also point to remote web feature services and web map services. So if there's another server out there, say USGS's um, uh, Topo uh, web map service, that you wanted to potentially present in a projection that's not supported by USGS, you could actually register their topographic WMS as a store in GeoServer and then create a layer based on that store that can then be published using any of the projections supported by GeoServer. And in that case, what GeoServer is going to do is it's going to, for a request against the layer that GeoServer is publishing, it's then going to send a request to USGS, get a map image back, and reproject it, and then deliver that map image out to the client that requested it. So there, that is a strategy you know, that we've actually used on a number of occasions when we had services that weren't available in projections that we wanted to integrate with other data sets, but we could run them through our servers in a cascading service. This is an example of a server that can provide those cascading uh, services where they're interacting with a remote service and bringing it in, processing the product in some way, and returning it out to the client that requested it. Other than those cascaded web map and web feature services, though, you're, de you're having to work with data that are on the local system. This is where, if we, create, if we click on Add New Store, our installation has pretty much the, um, the basic default file formats that are supported by GeoServer. You can add an extension to GeoServer that provides support for any of the formats supported by Google and OGR. Our friends you know, from doing Google Info and OGR Info, remembering that those are two libraries that provide the ability to read a wide variety of raster and vector data formats. There's an add-in for GeoServer that allows you to use Google and OGR to significantly extend the number of data sources that are supported by GeoServer. In this case, we're working with just essentially the default formats that are baked into GeoServer at its core. So you can see for vector data sets, you can basically point it at a directory full of shape files, and it'll treat that entire collection of shape files as a single store that you can refer to. Post GIS, um, we haven't uh, really talked a lot or much at all about uh, geo databases, geospatially enabled databases, but Post GIS is an open source geospatially enabled database that if you have an instance of that that you can connect to, you can use that as a vector data source. Um, this is where a, a properties data type is essentially a Java property file that I have no experience with whatsoever. Um, I have gone to great lengths in my years of working on computers of avoiding all things Java. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, that string is, is unbroken in terms of my understanding or use of Java properties, but by God, GeoServer, since it's actually a Java-based uh, application, um, can use those uh, Java property files as a data source. Um, shape files, as you might expect, um, is a very commonly used uh, vector data set. And then a web feature server. Again, this is that ability to act as a cascading service. So there's that remote web feature service that is publishing data that you want to be able to bring in as something that looks like locally stored data in terms of being able to then configure layers for publication by the server. Raster data sources, again, a lot of the usual suspects, arc grids, so those uh, classic um, ArcGIS uh, grid formats, GeoTIFFs, um, GTOPO30 uh, data files, uh, 
mosaics. Uh, so this is, this is something that you more often than not will find yourself generating outside of the system, but, but you can read the documentation on image mosaics if you want to learn more about how you can basically take multiple raster data sets and create a mosaic out of them or a virtual mosaic out of them to be presented as a single store. Um, and then also this world image is a, a, a model for raster data that goes back quite, quite a while where you could have other graphic formats like JPEGs or PNGs or GIFs and you could actually have in the same directory with those files a separate, uh, separate uh, file that ha uh, called a world file that basically has information about the uh, uh, coordinate system that that image corresponds to. So that that system, if it can read that JPEG, it can say, okay, here's a JPEG image. Here's what the, the corner coordinates of that JPEG are. Let me then uh, combine, treat it as a geospatial data set. Um, You'll find that, you know, actually uh, fairly frequently where um, like TIFF files are a good example of that, where you might have a non-geotiff TIFF file and you'll find in the same directory a file that ends with the same file name .tfw. That .tfw is a world file. How do they come up with that extension? And this is just a pattern to be aware of, is the normal extension for a TIFF file is TIF. For a world file, you take the first and third letters of, those, of that extension, you compress them together and add a W at the end. So .tiff becomes TFW. Um, uh, for a PNG, it would conceivably be PGW, so on and so forth. Um, then also you see the option for a, a cascaded web map service that you can choose from when uh, creating a new data source. So let's go ahead and add a new shape file. So you just click on the format that you want, the format of the file that you want to add. And it's going to bring up a dialog that basically um, gives you the options that are appropriate for that type of data set. A lot of these are fairly generic, so a lot of the options are going to be the same. The first thing you want to do is make sure to choose the right workspace because when you add that store, it's going to be associated with that workspace. So when you're trying to find it later, if you're looking in your workspace and you put the store in a different one, you're not going to find it. So you need to choose the right workspace to create this store in. So we'll create this in the test student workspace. You need to give it a name. And that name needs to be unique. So we'll call this uh, test student XYZ123 so that it's totally cryptic and I know that I really want to delete it later. Um, meaningful data source names are good, um, but you need to remember that they need to have no spaces in them. Um, and I think they can't start with numbers either because they, uh, the, there, there are some naming restrictions, but the bottom line is they need to be unique and they can't have any spaces. Um, then you can add a description. So I can just say my test data store based on a shapefile. And I can immediately choose whether or not it's enabled. Not, you know, I think in most cases you're going to want it to be enabled so you can just leave that checked. Then you need to point to where that file is. Um, this is one of the nice additions in more recent versions of GeoServer. Previously, you had to type them in and try to get them right. Now they actually have a browse interface where you can open it up and actually browse the file system of the local computer. So any of the directories that, the Geo, that GeoServer, um, uh, essentially the GeoServer user has access to, you can navigate to those directories through this browser. So. GeoServer has its own data space, which it starts in by default. But I would recommend the simplified approach to use for your work in GeoServer is to actually, just as this week's, yeah, this week's assignment asks you to do, is to just create a data directory in your home directory on the new server and just store your data files there. And then you can navigate to them by doing this. 
So I just click on this menu here, and I can just click on this slash. That takes me to the root of the file system. I can then click on home, where all of our home directories are on the computer. This is where we can see all of our usernames. So I can choose the test student home directory. And in this case, I have a shape file sitting here in the root of the home directory, but I also have this data, full, data directory that I already created in the test student. Uh, and I, and there, now you can see I have three files in this data directory. So we can choose, say, this county one, and then I can click on this county shape file. So it automatically then filled in this path all the way out to that shape file. So I didn't have to type it in. I was able to just navigate to it. Historically, the, typing this stuff in was always a giant pain because nine times out of 10, you'd get it wrong somewhere or another. Now it takes care of it for you. Um, these, other, these other default values are normally the reasonable to leave in place. Um, so we'll just hit save. So now, as soon as I create that store, since the normal workflow is you add a store, you're generally doing that because you want to create a new layer. So it immediately provides you with a new layer uh, window. If you don't want to create a new layer, you can just go back to the stores or go someplace else. But in this case, we can actually create a new layer based on the, the store that we just added and just hit publish. That brings up essentially the, the, the dialogue that you would be presented with to capture the information about the layer that you're creating. So here, this is the information that I would uh, provide for this new layer. And again, a lot of this should be familiar to you because this is information that would be showing up in the get capabilities response for that particular layer. So now we're down in the layers area of that capabilities um, XML document and the information that goes in there. Coordinate reference systems. Um, this is one of those areas where having access to the metadata, knowing what the coordinate reference system is for your data sets is critical um, because in some instances, GeoServer cannot automatically fill in the information about the coordinate reference system um, and basically put it into this native SRS. You'll see here it says native SRS unknown. That's because the information that it was able to read using OGR info in this case, or the equivalent within its programming environment, it did um, essentially pull this information out of the information about the data set and from this, we can infer that this actually looks like a, uh, a geographic coordinate system based on WGS84. So what, what's, the, what's the EPSG code for that? 4326. Exactly, for EPSG 4326. So there are some things that will be tattooed on your brains by the end of this class, and that's probably one of them. Um, so we need to, in this case, since the spatial reference system is unknown, or if it's wrong, there may be an instance where GeoServer thinks it's one thing and it's actually something else. You can provide a declared spatial reference system that you can use to then override whatever GeoServer thinks it is. And we can do that by um, either just typing in the EPSG code, or if you don't remember, if it's something weird, you can actually use their find tool and start looking through all of the supported projections for one that meets your needs. And see, do they have, now you can see there are 4,956 uh, projections that GeoServer is aware of. This is why it sometimes breaks clients. So let's do four, we can just look for 4326. There it is. 
and we can click on the link here and it just puts in what we had already typed in. If you're wanting to um, basically make sure that that declared spatial references is going to be used, make sure you have forced, forced declared um, here. If they're the same and it's actually showing up in the native SRS, you can say keep native. But you know, more often than not, you're going to need to be declaring a spatial reference system, and this is how you do it. Once your spatial reference system is, um, is developed, you can then deal with the bounding box. Because you'll notice that the bounding box here is not uh, filled in. So we can click on this link here to compute it from the data. If the coordinate reference system, spatial reference system is defined, then the information from the data set can hopefully be used to actually calculate the native bounding box. Uh, and that's the bounding box in the native coordinates. So in this case, it's 4326 decimal degrees. If it was, say, UTM, we'd be see seeing values here in UTM meters when we're talking about the native bounding box. That's distinct from the latitude-longitude bounding box, where in this case, these should be the same because WGS84 is latitude-longitude. But again, if it was UTM, we'd have UTM meters in the native bounding box and we'd have the latitude and longitude values that correspond to those UTM meters in the uh, lat long bounding box field. You want to make sure both of those are populated with values because that, again, is information that is going into the capabilities response for the service. Finally, and this is something that will come into play next week when we start talking about styling within GeoServer, Part of that is being able to actually uh, refer to properties or fields, attributes of those data sets by name so that you can use them to determine what styles you might be using or for app applying filters to determine what features may be styled or not even, or even displayed. So you see here that there's information about the types of features, the variable types and the, and the, and the, uh, and the variable names that are, that are a part of the data set. There are some additional options that you can um, play with. So let's, let's go to publishing. This is where you can start applying styles. So, and we'll talk about styles next week, but this is how you get to them. Um, other information about the service in terms of attribution, logos, things like that, that may be optionally available. Um, and other format issues. Now, now we're talking about options that are specific to this layer. So we've got data out there that we can build one or more layers upon. And each of those layers may have different styles associated with them, maybe have different settings associated with them. So this is down at the level of individual layers that you're publishing from the system. So let's hit save. And now that's taken us to the, uh, the list of layers on the system. So if we go to, let's see, here's my test student XYZ123 that is in my list of layers. And I can then actually click on this existing layer or any other layers in the system to come back to the settings for that layer. So if you need to change any of the settings for a layer, you can just go to the layers list click on the name of the layer and go back to it, okay? So now we want to see if that layer actually is even functional in the system. We haven't generated any errors yet, but now now's our opportunity to test to see what it looks like. So we can go down to, see where the heck, uh, it's probably the on the next page, no, where was it? So let's sort them by, uh, name and here is see that was see it's actually showing the title not that screwy name that I gave to it but it's this it's this one right here that I that I created um, and you'll notice that the name includes both the uh, workspace and then the store name okay um, or the 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 name of the data set actually. And then the title here, which is based on 
based on the name of the data set as well. So then you have options for previewing those data in a variety of ways. There's actually a native open layers previewer. So this is now the, essentially the web map service published for that layer um, being uh, viewed in a generic open layers client. You can expand some of the options by clicking this little button here where you can actually change the WMS version. Um, you can change the tiling. So where again, this is a single tile versus a tiled. You remember when we were talking about open layers and the options that you have for configuring either single layer or multi-tile requests. If you've associated multiple styles with that layer in that, in that, um, in that publication area, you can actually choose from those multiple styles here. Um, so you have a bunch of options. Um, any av available formats. So you can see by default we've got four different graphics formats. Um, all, sorts of, all sorts of options. But this is bottom line give us, giving us a pretty good indication that this layer is actually working. If we go back, we also can actually take a look at it as a KML or GML file or you can actually go to the full list of all available formats and there are a bunch of them. So we were actually configuring uh, the layer itself, but you can see it's automatically published as both web map and web feature service since it's a vector data set. So we could choose, you know, what does it look like as a, a GML2 web feature service? And what we're getting is then the, um, in this case, the GML get feature response for that for that uh, particular layer. So you can do some pretty robust testing of your layers from within the layer preview. Um, as I said, next week we're going to talk about styles and we'll work some more on this, but is this relatively clear in terms of the workflow for working with data that are on the system? So the other thing that I want to very quickly show you, um, but there are the two short YouTube videos that go through PuTTY and Fugu. Turns out Fugu, if you're running a modern Mac, won't work anymore. With, with uh, Mavericks, uh, we no longer have support for the, uh, the code base for Fugu. So I'm going to have to, over the next couple of days, figure out an alternative for uh, getting data from the Macintoshes onto the system. You can actually do it from the terminal. It's just a command line option as opposed to a GUI option. Um, but the, the videos basically take you step by step through the process. But let me go into PuTTY. Let me open up Windows here. And the principle remains the same. Um, it's just the interface is slightly different. So I'll open up PuTTY in Windows here. And PuTTY basically provides you a way to connect for transferring files from your system to, um, now actually PuTTY is our, is our uh, I'm, I'm now confusing myself. PuTTY is for the terminal connection. So you can have a command prompt on the remote system. So if, we, if we're connecting to the remote system, it's geog485.unm.edu. And here I'm using the SSH protocol, the default for PuTTY. And I click on Open. The first time you connect, you're going to see this message. And then you just say, um, yes. And it'll store that information. It'll then ask you for your login name and your password. That'll bring you to the command prompt where you can actually copy files and move files around as I, as I presented in the milestone for being able to move files into your home directory and create new directories and such. Um, the reading with just sort of the quick reference for Unix provides some of the brief explanations of some of the key commands. We're not going to be doing much detailed stuff. The primary focus in the Linux system that we're working on here is just getting data onto it so that you can point to it from GeoServer.
So we're not needing to do much, you know, if you can figure out how to shove data into the right place, then you're good to go. <laughs> um, so PuTTY is the way you can open up a terminal from Windows. Um, on the Mac, you can open up the terminal program, um, which is just available through the applications and then utilities on the Mac. And that brings up a command prompt. And on the Mac, it's just SSH and then the username that you want to connect with. Because uh, otherwise, it'll assume that it's the username that you have on your Mac. So unless you have the same username on your Mac as you do on the system you're connecting to, it's going to get confused. So in this case, I'm going to put kbenny at geog485.unm.edu. So the SSH is that same secure shell that we were using in PuTTY. So I hit return. Again, this is the first time I'm connecting from my terminal here. So it's asking me to confirm that connection for the first time. I say yes. It's asking me for my password. And then I'm at the command prompt. Either way, when you log into the class server, you're going to automatically be in your home directory. So that's where you are in the file system. So if I do an ls here, that's a listing of the files and directories in my home directory. So for the assignment, when I ask you to create a data directory, it's just mkdir for make directory and the name of the directory that I want to create. In this case, data. And you'll see that I already have a directory here called week 13 data, that we, which is where I put the data for this week's milestone that you'll be copying data from. But now I just created a new directory, so if I do an ls again, you'll now see there's this data directory here. I can change into that directory by just typing cd for change directory and data. All of these commands are the same, whether you're connecting from a Mac or a PC, because now I'm basically typing in commands on the server that's sitting in the room over there. It's as if I'm sitting on the keyboard on that computer typing these commands in. So copying files. Let me go back to Windows. And I should have, because I was focused on PuTTY earlier. Let's see. WinSCP is the recommended um, program under Windows for connecting to that remote server to then transfer files from your local computer to that remote server or vice versa. So if I open up WinSCP, you'll see this, you know, it looks very similar to what we were starting to do in PuTTY in terms of you need to provide the host name. And in this case, your username and password. Because in this case, what's happening is um, WinSCP is passing all of that information to the remote server over a secure connection to establish the, the ability to then start swapping files. And what we're going to do is we're going to change over to SCP, the secure copy protocol, and hit login. And again, we're connecting to this server for the first time from this, from this program, so it's going to ask us about the host key. So we'll say yes. It's going to tell us the status of the connection. And look, now we actually have a view of our local file system here on the left and the remote file system there on the right. So I can actually even create, I could have created this data directory from within Win, WinSCP. I could just go down here and, you know, right click and say, uh, let's see, is it going to let me, I thought, it, yeah, there we go, new directory. So I can actually create my new directory from here in WinSCP as well. You can do the same thing in whatever tool we're going to find for the Mac to be able to do this. But... I have to find a new one. Fugu was so good for so long, too. I'll miss it. Uh, <laughs> but 
so basically, you've got access to the remote file system and your local files, and then it's a matter of just dragging files from one place to another. So let's see, do I have any, you know, I'm not sure I actually have, let's see if I've got anything in my local directory here. So here I've got, say, a folder of shapefiles that I downloaded earlier. And I can open up the data directory on this side. And I can just drag this folder from my local system to the remote system and hit copy. And that's it. It just moved those files from my local hard drive to that local system where I can then have access to them through that browsing interface in GeoServer. Okay? And I think this is probably a good point to stop and maybe we can spend the last 20 minutes checking to see if you can actually connect via the, um, the secure shell. So either from the terminal application on the Macs or um, or PuTTY on Windows, and you should even be able to do it from the workstations in here if you don't have a computer with you, because um, we should have SFTP on all of the computers here in the lab. So you can test to make sure that the username and password that I gave to you um, actually work. Um, and one thing also that you can do once you log in is you can change your password to something less cryptic. Um, and the process for doing that is just to type in, so you can see I'm still logged in as my user here. Um, I can just type in the PASSWD command. That's basically the command to change my password. So I hit return. It asks me for my current password. And then it asks me to type in my new password twice. And it's not going to like the new <laughs> password I typed in because I actually don't want to change my password. But you type in your new password twice, and that will then be the new password you use when you connect to the system. Changing your password here does not change your password in GeoServer. The fact that they're the same right now is only because I set them up independently to have the same password.